Hello and welcome to Digging in the Dome. I'm probably rolling solo today as Kevin takes care of his young child, leaving me to talk to our to our super cool guests. And uh, this one definitely qualifies as cool as shit. Um, so this guest has an eclectic set of talents, including being a composer whose music could be heard in 200 TV shows worldwide. But from my research, his power more, his main squeeze is writing. He's the author of novels, short stories, comic book issues, graphic novels, and now I see a screenplay potentially in the works, so we'd definitely be digging into that. His subject matter is often rooted in mystery, fantasy, and horror. Let him be a mystery no more. Morgan Quaid, welcome to Digging in the Dome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Great right oh, to be here. Glad to have you. So um, let's first talk about where you're from. The accent kind of gives it away, but let's be specific. <laughs> uh, I'm from uh, Australia and at the moment in Brisbane, Australia, which is the sunnier side of the, well, okay, most of the country's sunny, but sort of mid-north on the on the uh, uh, eastern yeah. coast. So, yeah, nice played, and sunny. I played Risk. I know what Australia looks like. Um, <laughs> did right. you conquer it is the question. You know what? Because I oh, I did win uh, in Australia often, but and it was good sort of strategically, but, man, like, that the Asia part, if you, if you got Asia, man, it's pretty much game over. Like that is so huge. You get so many troops. Man. I mean, you I, could, you could say that about the real world. So yeah. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you got a point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, so you've been, you've lived in Australia all your life. You, the entire time you've been on the same planet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've I lived here all my life. Uh, started down low uh, in Melbourne and then sort of moved up and down, went, went to Cairns, which is far North sort of tropic region uh, when I was a teenager mm -hmm. and then settled in, in Brisbane as kind of a halfway between the, between the two. I've even been to Western Australia, which is right over the other side. Uh, but I was too young, so I can't really remember any of that, but I'm sure it was great. I'm sure it was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so like uh, obviously, and I said in the in the introduction that it feels like writing is really like your main thing. Like you really love it. I know. Obviously, you're a musician. I see the litany of guitars behind you and a banjo. Uh, so, yeah. uh, and multiple banjos. Actually, let me take that back. I see more than one banjo. Um, so, obviously, that music is is near and dear to your heart. But music seems to me uh, is that what you've, you you're most in love with? If there was a creative outlet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Writing is the thing I love most and will, will always do. Uh, and it's the thing that pays worst. So it's, it's the kind of a, you know, <laughs> yeah. Catch 22. Yeah. 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 That's right. It's the thing. Uh, is the, the music actually does make uh, money. Um, not, not huge amounts, but it does make money with the writing. Uh, it's a long, 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 long game, particularly in comics and graphic novels because of the costs involved. Um, but I love it. I, and I'm, it's one of those things that if I, if I was on my own and nothing else was going on, I would have to write anyway. So I might as well do it and try and make a go of, uh, you know, doing it for a living. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting. Um, obviously there's, there's elements of, and, and I was, um, uh, you know, I wrote for a few, and this is when I was really younger newspapers and, and I read for, I wrote for a couple of magazines. It's not nearly what you did. Um, but certainly I understand that, that bug. And, you know, uh, obviously we don't do all the things off the cuff here. Spoiler alert fans. We actually prepare for our shows sometimes and our, our, our <laughs> research, you know, it'd be great just to say, man, these guys just know everything about everything. That would be a lie. Wonderful. We know very little about most things, but we are good <laughs> enough to Google. Um, so, you know, from your perspective, like, you know, you, when did you first like really fall in love with it? Like you just started to like, this is when you realized, man, I absolutely love writing. It was probably, uh, probably in my twenties. Uh, I had a uh, deadbeat job that I hated. It was in a call center. It was the night shift. So it was just terrible. And I had a lot of time. And so I just started picking up writing and, and doing that. And I, I've always loved reading and reading fantasy and sci-fi and weird fiction and all that sort of stuff. So writing was kind of like another, 
you know, extension of that because you're kind of the first reader of whatever you're creating. So you get to make these amazing worlds and you're the first one to see them and explore them and kind of try and break them and then fix them again. Um, so that was when I really, I actually wrote a, a, a novel called uh, Deep Sleep, which has never gone anywhere. And I was going to say, I looked at your, your whole somewhere. litany of different, uh, you know, your, your massive amount of your bibliography, if you will, of all the things <laughs> that you're doing. And I didn't see that one. So what happened? It's, <laughs> it's not, it's not there. It's one of those ones that it's the first one you do. I mean, the writing wasn't great. Uh, the idea was very cool. Um, the idea is basically uh, they eliminate sleep in the future. So there's no, there's no need for sleep anymore, but that completely changes the world economy because everything is 24 hours. You can ring Beijing at any time and get orders across or whatever. So the economy explodes, everything goes, you know, haywire. Um, but you you know, they, they have, uh, um, uh, they build houses without bedrooms because you don't, you need, don't need to them. sleep anymore. Yeah, right. exactly. So, th- so everything changes and the story kind of hinges on this one sort of crusty uh, ex-journalist who is one of like 0.001% of the population that the drugs that you take to stop sleeping, they don't work for him uh, and he's an insomniac. So yeah. he's lying there awake, surrounded by all these people that are always awake, but he can't sleep, but he desperately needs sleep. So it's that kind of, um, I like kind it. Of thing. So that was a cool idea, but. It's yeah. just, I, I haven't gone back to it for some reason. I think I'm daunted by going back to it and, and you know, re exploring that, trying justice. to figure it yeah. out. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've gotten, you've sharpened your tools. Like, you know, so you've gotten yeah. better over time. You know, um, I think that everybody does when you, with anything in practice, you're like getting more um, skilled and, and more able to be able to tell those stories easily. And it becomes kind of like, you know, it's, it's, you know, again, making correlations to um, some things that, that we've done. That, um, it, like as starting this podcast, like starting the podcast, mm-hmm. you know, and I was a broadcaster before my, my co-host Kevin was not, um, but he's, uh, he does very well and he's can keep, and I know him, I've known him forever. So we can talk forever, right. It's yeah. not a big deal. Um, but obviously if you lose, go back and listen to the beginning of our, our, our podcast episodes until now, it's massively different in terms of quality or yeah. the lack of ums and uhs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. 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 It's uh, and you're right. It's exactly the same with writing. It's uh, and, and even simple things like, um, grammar repeat, repeating, the same thing three or four times that you've already said one way. Why are you, why are you doing it? You know, all, all those simple oh, things. Yeah. yeah. You just, you pick a lot of that. Up. And a lot of that is for me anyways, working with editors as well. And then realizing, oh, okay. I've been doing this for 20 years and I didn't realize that's where the comma goes. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's good to know. You know, simple things like that, that you should know, but for some reason they just don't stick. Um, and it all kind of improves the the storytelling and yeah. For right. sure. Well, that gives you, and again, so, uh, you know, what, do, what did you start with? So you said you, you, you wrote the novel that we are never going to read deep sleep, um, <laughs> which by the way, I could, I could result, I re- relate to that. Cause I am an insomniac. I got, I I'm a terrible sleep, chronic insomnia. So like, I wake up multiple times at night. I never get any more than like four hours sleep unless I'm like sick four or five. So it's, it's a rotten yeah. existence. So I can really, I could commiserate with your, your lead character, your, your protagonist. I can, I understand. Uh, I would be really oh, pissed man. off if those drugs didn't work for me. Um, yeah, but, yeah. so you started with that, but what did you go to? Was it like, did you start continue to write novels? What did you get like bridge into like comic books and graphic novels? Comic, comic books and graphic novels. That was a, a fairly recent thing. Uh, so as a kid, I was never really that interested in, in comics. Um, the, the words versus the images kind of confused me and it was just, it was too much. I didn't want to read. I just wanted to watch, um, yeah. or I wanted to just read and not have to watch. So it, it kind of threw me a bit. Um, it wasn't until a, a, a failed career as a novelist that I, you know, went through that whole sort of depressing journey. Uh, yeah. for about 10 years. And then I walked into a comic book shop in, in Brisbane um, and discovered these indie comics that I knew nothing about. I started picking them up, started reading them. And I thought, oh my God, what have I been doing all this time? And I could have been doing this. And I was, you know, doing the hard slog with novels and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. So then I bought everything I could, you know, threw all my money at it, did as much research within you know, a week that I could and immediately started, all right, I have to get the novels that I have and turn them into comic book series or graphic novels. Right. And I just started doing that. And then 
proceeded to make um, every mistake in the book that you could make uh, without ah. talking to anyone in the industry that knows about oh. this stuff. I just went head first in. And you thought, got excited. You were like, this I is got great. Very excited. I'm very excited. I want to get into it. And then all, then you realized, oh man, I probably could have saved myself a lot of pain. I would just talk to somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. <laughs> a lot of pain, a lot of money, a lot of time. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, it's yeah, but you know, but like I say, at that time I was just so excited to get into it, so it it kind of didn't matter, uh, you know. It was just, it's all an experience. It all adds up to it. Um, but yeah, if anyone came to me and said, "Oh, how how do I write a comic book or a comic?" I, I would give them completely different advice to the the track that I took. Because yeah, it was it maybe was all the opposite thing. things of what you did. <laughs> like I don't yeah. do this. No, I did this. Don't, don't do this. Yeah, yeah it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like that thing where you know you got to make you got to learn the rules and know the rules and then become a master and then you can break the rules. I just broke the rules straight right. away. I just no rules. Straight. The rules so, book out. Yeah, Don't need them. wrong size format, um, oh. oversized printing, which is great for for some things now. Like a lot of comic mm-hmm. creators love the oversized thing as a special. I just did it as standard. I lost money on the the printing and the the oh. enormous postage cost because this thing was massive, you know all those sorts of things. Oh but, man! So you know. but did, now because you said something that actually really resonates with me because I as a kid was kind of hit or miss with comic books. There were mm. some that really got me. Like I remember uh, Todd McFarlane Spawn. I read that uh, all of those when I was little and younger. Right. And uh, X Men like the, the, that one was a kind of like I, but like I was busy doing a thousand other things and playing sports and doing all. all, So I don't really wasn't interested in it. Now as an adult, I'm reading the, I'm gobbling these things up like nobody's business. I think because the quality of them has changed so much. Like if you, I went back and looked at a old, like I was looking for a bat. I was like on my Apple books, which is, I, you know, look for a, I don't get the paper comics, not, I love them. Don't get me wrong. Um, But you know, I just kept, where am I going to, I have no you value space. Yeah. yeah I, value <laughs> yeah. I can't put them. So I, so in order to get through them, cause I want to continue to read, um, I, I download a lot of these and, uh, I, f- I found a Batman and it said golden era Batman. I'm like, Oh, what's that about? I download it. And it's from like, like the third, the forties, the fifties or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, the stuff. writing in this is terrible. <laughs> oh God. G Willikers, Batman. Holy Blah blah yeah. blah. Holy you know, cannoli! Like, uh, yeah, and it's like, ugh, God, <laughs> shoot me! I didn't finish it. I, I was like two pages into it. I'm like, I can't read this nonsense. Yeah, it's one of those things. I think if you missed it at the time, it's very hard to go back now and appreciate it and go, yeah, that's that's really. And even simple things like, oh yeah, the the printing is all sort of overlapping a little bit, and it's not really precise, and it's, and then the certain rules never get broken. So the the speech bubbles are always the same way, and and the text is always the same way. The lettering and everything which makes sense if people are used to that. But yeah, that's what I loved about the first indie comic that I picked up and started reading. I thought this is just doing anything it wants. It's this is any story. It can be horror, comedy, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the style is different. The artwork is different. They're blending different styles of artwork. That was the appealing thing because I'd I'd never been into superheroes. It's been so overdone. It's not, it just isn't appealing to me as a writer, but the fact that I could take anything I'd done and translate it into this format, I thought, well, yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Here's my money. Take it. Yes. Take it all. Take my money. I'll take it all. And and, and (laughs) honestly, the, the thing that's interesting too, like, you know, I saw a lot of threads in, in that kind of connect your work back to, like I said, fantasy, like the, these mm-hmm. ideas, these fantastic landscapes, these big worlds that you can really explore in a lot of different ways and, and take somebody through those stories. And, and uh, I started to think about uh, influence because I, I, so just mm-hmm. a perspective from what would be both of us, if he was actually here, um, we were in a band together for 17 years. We were, I've been known him since he was five, six years old. So we've known each other forever. Right. <laughs> and, uh, we started off and we should make you feel a little bit better. We were in a band called Decidorata and we, you know, like I remember in going to Sonic studios in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and putting $5,000 on my credit card to pay for that album. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a like Sonic studios is iconic place because they like lots of, we met very famous people when we were recording our album there. Alanis mm. Morissette, um, Kevin, my co-host actually called, um, Robert Palmer, Peter Gabriel or something like that. And Robert Palmer called him a wanker, which was great. Uh, <laughs> we met the roots. 
Um, like we met like all kinds of cool people when we did it, but like the engineer could give a rat's ass about the Cedar Rata, like some a bunch of 20 year olds. Yeah, yeah. They used to, they were like, let me steal your money and not give you yeah, any yeah. anything like anything of quality back. So our first album, it's good for the fact that we did it and we had we have like uh two since then and one that's unfinished. But um, you know, it's it's that those early lessons that you kind of learn, you realize, you know what, I didn't have to spend five thousand dollars. What I needed to do is find an engineer that actually gave a shit about our music and could produce it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It, along that lines, because you're the writer, I'm assuming that you're not drawing or inking, right? So how do yes, you pick correct? How do you pick the the people? Because I see that there's certain people that you kind of go back to, but how did you connect? To those people to, to actually get your vision, you know, to match the words or to the, the picture to match what you're saying. Yeah. So th- this is an interesting one because, um, <clears throat> pardon me, the, um, this is where it really pays to be a great writer. And I, I consider myself a pretty good writer. I'm not an amazing, amazing, you know, I'm not going to change the world or whatever, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a decent writer. I love right. what I do. It's great but I'm also a decent business person. And that's the thing that most creative people are missing. And as soon as you start hiring multiple artists, uh, you know, uh, pencils, inks, colors, all the rest of it, um, and trying to build a team, you're running a business. And that's a very different thing to this is a pet project and I love it. And I, and then you have to start thinking about how am I actually going to make money off this thing? And I'm, I'm paying huge amounts for the artwork, understandably, because it's incredibly You're detailed. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that was, it, again, it was trial and error. The, the yeah. fortunate thing for me is I'd already been running a music business for, uh, 10 years or seven years up to that point, mm-hmm. um, working with session musicians, um, building out primarily loop packs and working with other producers on their mm-hmm. stuff and, and a few indie indie creatives along the way as well, but primarily behind the scenes with that sort of stuff and then doing the, the uh, production music for film and TV, mm-hmm. uh, which is nowhere near as glamorous as, as what it <laughs> sounds like. <laughs> Um, but because of that, uh, I'd been used to dealing with, you know, I must've dealt with a hundred different session musicians and bought things and, you know, set up contracts and signed contracts and even had duddy contracts that I couldn't get out of. And so I had all that experience. So coming to writing was just, all right, this is the same thing. And I effectively need to audition artists to see what the quality is like, which means I'll pay X amount for two pages for, 50 artists, um, over a period of time. And I might only choose 10 of them, but, Mm -hmm. you know, and some of those will be unreliable. Some will be great. Some will be too expensive. So it's all about that, finding that happy medium. Then the other thing is how the heck do I get across to them what I have in my mind, uh, from a novel and and an existing story that I'm very familiar with the characters and all that sort of stuff. How do I get that across? And how do I get that across when I have an artist in Venezuela, uh, an artist in uh, Poland, uh, two artists in Indonesia, they're all all over the place. Um, So and you're, not gonna be flying all, you're not flying all over there to go and see them. No, no, it's all, it's all online. It's all, it's all connecting online and, and finding yeah. them and, and doing it that way. Uh, it's funny. Uh, Willie Roberts is one of, one of my favorite artists and he, I've worked with him for years now and I, I count him as a, a good mate. Um, uh, never, never met him. You know, I mean, we, we've seen face to face on zoom and stuff, but, but never, right. never met him, but you know, you just feel like, you know, the guy because we worked together for, for so long or have been. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it is, all, it, it's a, it's a strange thing. And it, it basically is for each artist, you need to speak a slightly different language. Um, so if I'm, if I'm dealing with the uh, Indonesian artists, um, they tend to, there's a little bit of a language barrier and they tend to do the more manga style stuff. Yes. So I'm very, very simple with instructions. I, I don't get it. I don't give them any detail about uh, the background to characters or anything like that. It's just a guy that looks like this is doing a thing like that. Here's a storyboard with a stick figure to show you. Mm-hmm. And then they will come back in their style and, and then make, it, make it look amazing. Yeah. Interesting. And so, so <clears throat> their context is more uh, mechanical because mm. they're just saying, just tell give me the, just the facts, ma'am. Now, then there's other people, obviously, that you work with that need. And do you feel like the quality, and this is not to disparage the Indonesian folks, I'm just asking, mm. do you feel like the quality is the same when you're talking to, to the person that needs to really understand, like, the richness of the atmosphere of your story and, like, the, the you know, more of a 360 view versus the people that are just, give me the stereo instructions and let me 
build this thing for you? Yeah, honestly, I think it is the way that I do it anyway is I pick an artist based on their style, the way they do characters, the way they do movement and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then essentially that's what I'm buying every time. And it's very rare that I'll go back and say, change this, change that, unless it's really wrong. Mm -hmm. With with me, it's much more of a 50-50 partnership. So I'll have the idea, I'll write it, I'll send it to them, but then what they come back with, it's invariably different to what I thought. Um, and there's a very good reason for that, which I'll tell you about in a tick. Um, so it'll come back different to what I thought, but then I will kind of re- rearrange the way I'm thinking about the character based on what I'm seeing. And then as the story progresses, it becomes, oh, okay, kind of a, a baby between the, the both of us, you know, a combination of both. Uh, <clears throat> so well, that, that does make yeah. sense though. It could, because what you're because you, like you're giving the story to somebody, and even if you give them the 360 view or if you give them the technical view, what they're seeing is what they're seeing. So they're saying, Well, yeah. you said this, this is what I picture that to be. So yeah. your words in that in that respect influence them. Now, interestingly, like the thing that you potentially lose a little bit there, which is awesome that they're able to still be able to do this without the context of intonation, uh, tone. Yeah. Like, you know, like you don't hear you unless you're you're like reading the pages to them and, and doing it in the, in the way, like trying to like give the emotion around it. I think that would be, um, it, it speaks to the talent of the artists that you're hiring, that they're able to capture it and, and really hit the mark as close as they do. Yeah. And, and you would be surprised how this is where I think the words come in because I'm very flexible with the lettering and, and I will write a draft script and all that sort of stuff. It changes a hundred percent of the time when I, when I actually see the page and I start lettering and that gives me the flexibility because an expression of, I might say, uh, they look angry mm-hmm. and there are 50 different ways they could be angry. Um, right. the, you know, the, some of the artists will just be very simple and it'll be an angry expression. Uh, some of them like Willie, he will get, he will, he will think to himself, they're angry, but I think they're angry enough to kick a trash can over or something. So I'll get, I'll have them doing that. He adds a bit more to it. Right. Either way though, with the text, that's where I I can contextualize what's going on. And that's where I'll change what I was going to say, because it doesn't make sense with that facial expression for him to say, by G Willikers, you know, it makes sense for him to say something harder or, you know, uh, yes. longer or whatever it might be. So that's the the flexibility. The other thing though, that I only discovered a couple of years ago, it's become a new thing. And every new disease I like to get on board pretty early or, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a thing called aphantasia. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know why I'm doing that because it is actually called aphantasia. <laughs> is that a made up word? A you thing. Just, yes. <laughs> called aphantasia. Tell aphantasia. me more. <laughs> um, and it's basically, it's a, uh, it's, it's people that have no visual imagination. So I, I went through all my life without realizing that people weren't like me. And it's only about, I think 2% of the population that have this. So if I close my eyes and you say, uh, think of an apple or something, I can't visualize anything. It's just black. It's always just black. Really? I have no way of representing anything. Uh, th- and it's so profound that, you know, the whole, oh, you can't get to sleep coming yeah. back to the insomnia thing, you know, count yeah. sheep, yeah. You know, count sheep jumping over a fence or whatever. You wouldn't be able to see them. No, that never made sense to me. I thought, oh, it's it's kind of maybe allegorical or metaphorical or whatever. Then then it's not, people don't really, you know, you can't really see stuff. And that's the way I thought imagination was until recently I found out about this thing and I realized, no. Every, and then I started talking to my wife and my son and realizing how profoundly different I am. But even things that deeper that I never realized, I, I so my mother passed um, a few years ago now. I can't remember her face at all. Right. Unless you, well, I mean, if you see a picture, I'm guessing that then you're, you're good, but you can't taking that can't picture and then putting it. it down. You can't recall it. You won't be, you'll be like, that's exactly right. So I, so I can't close my eyes and remember my mother's face, but I even worse, I can't remember my wife's face visually and we're married. Wow. Like we, we, she lives in this house, but I can't, I, my, my son. So I can't pick, which is part of the reason I think why I give so much to the artists because I I have a clear picture of what people are doing, how they're acting, what's happening, all lots of stuff. But in terms of a visual of what does this person look like, right? it's very hard for me to make that up on my own. I have to kind of rely on the artist a bit more with that stuff. That's amazing. And that's like, wow. Like to be able to, it's, it's, it probably is what makes you to a degree a really good writer because you're you're able to frame it without having to see it. You could just kind of say, this is what's happening. This is the, and then again, build in, uh, the emotional components to it. And again, the, the, it's it, to not be able to see it in your head has is, is incredible to be able to write it 
it, mm. with such great detail and ability. Um, that's impressive. I, 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 and I think, yeah, I think that has, I think that's why I like descriptive phrases so much. I, I like the musical intonation and the rhythm of when, a, of, you know, a sentence behaves a certain way. But I also like, you know, you listen to great, uh, great writers and I'll always say, show me, don't tell me, you know, and I'll always say, you know, don't, don't use too many adverbs and adjectives and lots of stuff. I love them and I love being overly descriptive in certain senses um, partly I think because that that's my only way to apprehend what's going on and to understand right. what's going on is by using these fancy words. Right. It makes um, sense. It does make sense. And like, you know, again, I think that that makes you unique in that, like how many, how many writers could say that they don't, they can't see the story in their head. That's incredible. That's gotta be very difficult. I can't imagine writing without thinking like that. You know what I mean? Being able to see it and be on the other, um, you know, the familial thing, which is really tough. And got to be challenging. Mm. I mean, uh, hopefully you, you keep a picture in the wallet or something. You can just keep yeah. going back to it. Yeah. That's my wife. All right. Got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank, thankfully, I don't have the, the uh, I can recognize faces so, and I can remember, yes. you know, that sort of stuff. But I've had endless discussions with my wife about this. She's, she's still, she believes me now, but it's still baffled by the whole. Hard for her to get her head around. Well, it's because it's hard for me it's to get incredible. anybody to be able to say, yeah, you can't, I can't think of an apple and know what it looks like. Like I picked yeah. it in my head. I know what it looks like. You can't do that. That's nuts. Um, so you mentioned music. I wanted to go to, to go to that because um, I'm a fellow musician and a composer. So um, the thing that came to mind when I was like, you know, uh, you get, ins- you get inspiration for, from artists that you respect, like same thing with comedy, right? We, this is a comedy mm-hmm. podcast style is, is an amalgamation of the people that influenced you. So, um, mm. you know, who would you say inspired you from a writing perspective and from a music perspective? Uh, writing's very easy. So that is, uh, writers like traditionally, you know, traditional fantasy writers like Robert Jordan and those, those sort of, those sort of guys, China, Mieville, uh, incredibly detailed, weird, amazing. It's like reading concrete, but it's, it's also just amazing. His stuff, uh, Jack Vance, his stuff, um, is amazing. So, so the, and, and even like Joe Abercrombie and those sort of, uh, I, I don't know, I think maybe they're grim dark or that sort of, you know, dark fantasy sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of my influences are, are, are there. And even the earlier, um, uh, the Shannara books, the Terry, uh, not Terry Brooks, Terry Brooks. It is Terry Brooks. Is it Terry, Terry Brooks? Brooks? I don't know. Anyway, that whole Shannara series. That Terry, was Brooks. <laughs> Terry Brooks. Terry Brooks, the, the writer. <laughs> Sorry. To, see, because I'm saying Terry, but my head is trying to get me to say Jerry, and I know it's not it's Jerry. Not Jerry Brooks? It's, it's not Jerry. I'm pretty sure it's Terry. It is Terry Brooks, the American writer, Terry Brooks. Yes. You're correct. Shannara. I remembered a thing. Yes. Well, so thank you, Terry Brooks. No more quotes. It is Terry. No it more is quotes. just Terry it's Brooks. Definitely, it's definitely Terry. <laughs> Um, so it's pretty easy on, on the writing because they're, they're pretty clear and you can see some of those influences in the stuff that I've written and even some of the ideas that I've borrowed uh, from writers yeah. that I admire. As well, we every, all do. Listen, every single person, this is the same thing with music. And as a musician, I'm sure you could respect this. We're mm. not doing anything new. Like there's not like, no, I mean, no. I, like mumble rap, I guess you could say is new, but I hate it. So <laughs> I don't count it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. I can mumble. You want me to mumble for you? Um, yeah. it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't really resonate with me. And again, other people have different, different, different strokes, different folks, whatever, but most of all music has been done, right? It's yeah. all just a play off of different combinations of different pieces. And now we're into like the mashup component of the, of the, uh, the musical journey and writers, same thing. The stories have all been told. I mean, like, not that your stories aren't impressive and and like are amazing and, and talk about different but the, the tropes the things mm. that are the themes are the same they're all the same yeah. you you have to i falls in yeah. love with girl yeah dude finds a dead body in his house they try yeah. to yeah. figure out who killed the person because they're going to get blamed for it like you know what i mean yeah someone you know those kinds of someone wins the lottery mysteriously and they were super broke and now they're the rich like the beverly hillbillies like oh yeah Okay, that story's been told. Hang on. What was what was that last one you said? Uh, <laughs> so they're broke. They discover oil in their. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, right. no, you're exactly right. It's um, and and it, and it's also like that doing something so profoundly different because you could do that as a writer. You could do something really disjointed and like nothing else. 
No one would understand it. It would be right. roundly criticized. You know, right. It's always that way with the first thing because you're speaking a different language to the people right. that you want to buy this thing. Um, on the music side, though, the music side is harder because I came from a, a very strict religious uh, sort of evangelical household. Oh, wow. So I have a, a massive gap in my uh, musical history because I was not allowed to listen <gasps> to that hateful, horrible, uh, demon-loving, secular music. Um, no way. For how you long? Know, like Perry Como and such. Um, for Well, for most of my life until I was in my early 20s. Uh, well, until I was able to, but, but see, like, by then I'd missed a whole bunch of stuff and I wasn't right. going to go back and, and try and rediscover that stuff. I was onto new stuff. Right. Um, so the, one of the, the themes that, that goes right through, particularly teenage years where I really started to get into guitar was people like Joe Satriani. Oh yeah. Because there were no words. So yes. because there were no words, my parents couldn't say, this is evil. You can't yeah, listen what, to it. What the tone is, 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 is demonic. Come on. Yeah, I mean, if they really were interested and they listened, they might they might have said yeah. that. But yeah. thankfully, I got away with that. So it was really that. Later on, though, it was I was right into you know like Jamiroquai and those sorts mm-hmm. of things. Yeah. Then I started to get into System and Down and you know uh-huh. a bit hard, harder, harder and heavier and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I actually started with guitar with uh, Latin stuff. Um, oh yeah. So not quite flamenco, but that sort of style. Yeah. Um, and then moved into electric guitar from there. But yeah, so it's it's kind of eclectic, but also incredibly narrow. And there, um, again, my wife will joke endlessly about I'll hear something. So most of my musical education is from TV, which mm-hmm. is ads and 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 films. Zest so I've only clean. ever heard the choruses. Zest fully clean. You're not fully clean. <laughs> exactly. I need some soap. So I I know all of these. <laughs> I know all of these songs, but I only know this little bit the most famous bit that's been used. So I'll hear the, a song will start on the radio earlier than that. And I won't have a clue what this thing is or who did it or when they lived or any of that sort of stuff. <laughs> but they get to the chorus and I think, I remember this oh, yes. from that movie that one time. And yes. that's it. It's so a Chevy commercial. Like rock. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Like uh, the um, it's, it's uh, again, really interesting background from a musical perspective because you were you were basically you know put away in in solitary confinement away from all things musical for a period of time where you couldn't listen mm. and then like you said that your influences were what you were exposed to um yeah. and then that expanded it's um it's interesting too because i think that um the, when i i thought about some of the well actually it was something on your website that kind of made me think that you just going back to the writing for a second that you had mm. a little bit of stephen king influence in you because you referred to your your the people as um, dear traveler, and that reminded me of Stephen King referring to his people as constant reader, right? So ah. constant reader being like, I, I think that that King understands that he has a lane, right? And he's got yep. a group yep. of people that really like his stuff, and then a whole bunch of people that think that he's terrible, right? Yep. I, I think there's probably very few of those people. I actually like Stephen King, um, but. Uh, and he talked about somebody who really gives you an entire universe. You ever read the stand? It's like a 1200 yeah. page book or something like that. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 Uh, but like, that's what, and then I thought about you, he's calling people the, the, the tra- you know, a dear traveler. Why traveler? Are you, is it because you're taking them on these crazy journeys to these like really wild places and, you know, into, into odd stories that are, you know, completely fantastic. Um, I think it's, I think it's more, um, so a, the good thing about being a writer is people will always read more intelligent, uh, answers into things than what you actually put in there, which is great. So they'll always assume yeah, I'm, I'm dissecting it. Like it's the Zapruder film. I'm like, well, what did you, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I think it's more, it speaks to my love of archaic phraseology and, and using okay. a, a term like dear, tra- you know, traveler or, yeah. um, and also the, there is that, that thought that you as a writer you've kind of got to grab people and you've got to yeah. so they're going past and you want them hooked and which is why most of my books the first two pages something very 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 dramatic so i'm not a stephen king writer mm-hmm. so i there's no sort of slow yeah moving, build to it you know, right yeah and no they do. Build. it is just yeah. Because I don't have the patience for that, uh, so it is. I'm right in there uh, straight away, and then they'll be building, and then right in. But but I want them hooked from the beginning. And I suppose that's like you know fishing in a stream. I, I want to you know if you're traveling past, hey, come on in. Yeah. Um. It's uh. Yeah. So my, it's probably more that, but definitely the Stephen King. The 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 funny thing is, 
never got through any of his horror books. Not one. Um, read the entire Dark Tower trilogy, loved it. It's fantastic. That, so that that is my Stephen King experience. So I do, ironically, I don't actually like his horror stuff. You like um, his fantasy stuff. I love his fantasy stuff, and I That's don't okay. like, like his fantasy stuff because it takes too long and it's not my style. And yeah, yeah, I think that the that one that if you haven't given it a shot, that would be falling into that same realm is Talisman, and um, I think it's called mm. Black House, which are more fantasy based than than horror based. Not really a horror horror book, um, right? You know, like it's not like Cujo, a you know, rabid crazy dog, or you know, yeah. You know, there, he definitely has Sh- The Shining, which is a great book, but it's it's again, it's it's a horror book. Yeah. So more, you liked more of that idea of this fantastic, you know, wild universe, crazy, you know, different thing. And I like, I love it. I also like that. Uh, look, uh, as the great Elvis said once, a little less conversation, a little more action. Why not start off with a bang? Why yeah. waste time? I love it. Because then you're like, yeah. okay, now I want to keep, I want to figure out. And then you could start to like, it's almost like you hit them in the face, boom. And then you just yeah. slowly kind of jab them a bit. Like, you know, like I'm going to slow it down a little bit here and build off of this, this first, you know, moment of, holy shit, what happened? Yeah. What's you happened? Know? Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what well, the first, uh, uh, one of my, so for, to start off with, I never thought I wrote horror at all until a friend recently said, you know, that you write horror, right? This is, this is technically horror anyway so that, that like kind of threw me a bit i just wrote <laughs> fantasy bro it's just fantasy what are you talking about um the one of my latest books the the seven hungers um uh it starts it's a, it's about a, a, a censured sorcer, sorcerer um who's basically brought out of retirement to to help with this emergence which is something has come through from one of these seven realms oh, like hell dimensions if you like and he, he's you know got to fix it but the book starts with him with his both hands and legs kind of sucked into a kitchen wall with a creature that is inhabiting the house, breaking his bones and ripping the flesh off his skin. And that's, that's the first start. So straight away, he's, he's about to die. You're coming into it. And then you like, ah, oh my God. Yeah. It starts with a broken, broken arm. And I think you got to start with another one, a whiplash, another novel I did starts with a, 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 a 18 year old young man getting abducted. And it's literally wake up, go downstairs. Someone's knocking at the door, open up the door. Someone tases me. Now I'm in the boot of a car. What the hell's going on? Right. And then you start to discover what the hell is going on. But yeah, it's, it's, and it's partly because I don't have the patience to, (laughs) yeah, to take my time anymore. I think the older I get, it's like, I just (laughs) show me a thing, show me something happening. Yeah. Well, it doesn't hurt for writing. No, I mean, it's, it's interesting. So, um, some of the, like, and one of the, the, the books, um, uh, Enmity that you wrote, um, uh, yeah, yeah. that that one was really intriguing to me because, uh, like, and it was it, this is a stupid trigger event for me, but I'll 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 own up to it. So I had read, I've been getting more into some of the more I guess critically acclaimed you know graphic novels um, over right. the course of the last several years, and one that I had missed not on purpose but I just missed was um, Sandman. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, so I, and the, the, the trigger was Netflix is creating a show that's launching in August based on that series. And I was yeah, like, yeah. well, I'd like to get an understanding of the source material because, you know, I'd like to see how not to be critical of it. I'm not gonna be like, Oh, you guys didn't do a good job, but like be able to get some backstory around Morpheus and that whole situation. So I did, I read all of those same, all the same book, all of them. And then, um, my dumb co-host who isn't here, told me that one of his guilty pleasures is watching the show Lucifer. Right. Yeah. And I'm just, and yeah. you ever, um, you know what that show is about? It's about, I, I do. I yeah. do. Yes. Lucifer lead. So your story is about Daisy, who is Lucifer's daughter. Right. Yeah. And it, it references the fact that Lucifer left hell, which is something that is written in the, that's part of that Sandman series of him basically handing the keys of hell over to Morpheus and saying, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm out of here. And then yeah. Morpheus then passes it off to, to Duma and Ramiel, the angels, and then eventually Mazikeen gets it. Like there's, there's all kinds of, it's been passed around like a bad joint or something to, to a bunch of different <laughs> people that don't want hell. They're just not interested in this. Um, and, uh, and even there was some other dude, I can't remember his name. Anyway, uh, point being is that I thought that maybe that there, that might've had something to do with your, um, the story. Was that intentional? Did, did you not read it? 
I have read some of Sandman. I've not gotten up to that bit, so neither. Oh, and I have watched Lucifer. Spoiler alert. Um, but you have watched I, it. Uh, I've watched Lucifer, but only the first season, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, so neither of those, ironically, <laughs> were the uh, impetus for this. I the, love the, it. The, the thing is, I actually studied in my young days, uh, studied theology, um, okay. learnt, he- learnt biblical Hebrew, learnt, learnt Greek, um, did all that sort of thing. And one of the things that struck me as I was learning that was uh, traditionally the idea of the devil or Satan or Lucifer or all that sort of stuff. It is not the, the, the one who owns hell, that sort of Lucifer. Right. It's this idea as an, of an <coughs> adversary. So mm-hmm. his job is basically to oppose everything that, that God puts in there almost to keep things in check and all that sort of stuff. So I actually like that idea better. So in enmity, um, Lucifer is the one that whispers in people's, you know, you know bad dudes like Hitler and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. he's, he's a check and balance because, because God in this universe is all about balance and keeping things in check, right. but he's just bored. Everything's the same. Humans just act the same way. So he just says, that's it. I'm out. I'm done. Mm-hmm. And because of that, that actually brings on the apocalypse. But, but before the apocalypse happens, he goes on a bender, he drinks, he does drugs, he does everything. And yeah. as a result of this, 16 years later, this girl, Daisy, pops up, not knowing that she's, you know. So, so it's essentially a story about Daisy searching through the wasteland for her deadbeat dad because her uh-huh. mother has passed on. Yes. Not knowing that her dad is Lucifer and not knowing why there are these kind of demon creatures tracking her and hunting her. And she has no idea why other than, well, I'm human. They probably just want to kill me. Right. So it's, that's kind of the, the story, but yeah, the Lucifer is so fun to write. Uh, and he does probably have some similarities to the the character in the, in the TV series. Yeah. Um, you know, smart mouthed and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but uh, but it came from a completely different spot. It's so it's, funny. Yeah. I, I'm over two. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, to dear traveler, obviously that's a play on the the same thing. Nope. <laughs> I should have just said. Read these I should have just said yes. No, no. no honesty Thanks. is the best policy. I want to be wrong um, because it's more interesting. It's if I'm just guessing all these things right, then it's it's probably. But and again, to your point, um, some of these things uh, you, you get from I get these threads have these tales have threads. Like the interesting thing mm. to me about um the the lucifer series from a comic book or graphic novel standpoint is like it's it, he doesn't in those books he's really not he's like i don't make anybody do anything he's like yeah i yeah. i got basically i tried to rebel against my dad i got kicked you know i kicked into hell to be basically to be the the arbiter of justice against and punishing people that have done the wrong thing Right. So like, yeah, it's just yeah. interesting, like to see again, the, 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 the differences between the, the stories of, uh, of, of, of the devil, you know, not some it's red dude right. with horns. And it's funny too, that like the, in the, the show and not so much the book, cause the book doesn't really say that he's hanging out with the, the detective person in solving crimes when you're trying to do an episodic, you know, like a, a, a like a, a, a truly like a, a series on TV, you have yeah. to have that. How are we going to keep having him do basically the same thing every single time and then yeah. still have the, the, the actual underlying story and, and stuff in there? Um, he was just a club owner. He just he just owned a nightclub. That was that was it. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see those things kind of uh, still still permeate. Um, I did want to ask you, I saw we talked earlier at the very beginning of the episode when I was introducing you about a screenplay. Let's sacrifice oh, Lord yeah. Jean, which I assume based on the title, rom com. So what's that? What's that? <laughs> what's yeah, it's it uh, about? it's a, it's it's a filmed in front of a live audience, uh, okay. multi cam. No, no, I'm joking. Oh no, um, I <laughs> was going with rom com. Like Big Bang Theory. Ugh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, tin can <laughs> laughter. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a it's a um, horror. Uh, a grindhouse kind of horror, horror deal, right. which is not my my normal thing. So a friend of mine, uh, 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 Justin Smith, is a, is an indie uh, director, mm-hmm. and he said, uh, "Oh, you know, I've worked with him on on, on a comic that, that's going to be coming out a little bit later." And he said, "Oh, do you write uh, screenplays?" And me being me yeah, said, like, "Yeah, of course, yeah, I sure." Do. You course. know, I've written one. I've written one at this stage, and I said, "Yeah, yeah, of course, I'm an expert, and I know all the things <laughs> about uh, these screenplays, as you call them." Um, so I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to give it a crack." So he gave me the basic idea, uh, which was primarily the title and this idea about basically two hitchhikers that get caught up in a sort of cult, a Manson Manson esque cult sort of vibe. Mm-hmm. And I and I went back to him. I remember and said. 
cool. Happy to do it. Love to do it. Is it okay if it gets really weird really quickly and you know, it'll have like weird, fantastical things in it. Cause so he knows enough yes. to, about the way I write that, that it's going to go that way. And he said, yeah, go for it. Go for it. That's fine. So I just started writing, the ideas started coming. And then, you know, as you start writing more and more ideas come up and you think, Oh, this is going to be great. And mm-hmm. um, it's a screenplays are fantastic because you, you get rid of the thing I hate most about writing, which is the fluff. Now I, I'm all for, uh, I love a good turn of phrase. I love being creative with the way things are described. I love that sort of stuff. I hate narrating how someone gets from part A to part B. I just don't care. I don't want to narrate them sitting in a car and then going through and then the car door opens and then they get out. I don't want to tell you everything that they're wearing, how they did their hair that day. I just don't care. I just get them to the thing and make the thing happen to them and then get into the emotion of it and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so with a screenplay, it's kind of like a stripped down version where you're not doing any of that couching in, in you know, background. You just, this person does this to this. They say this, this person reacts this way. This, you know, this person says this, blah, blah, blah. So it's this amazing stripped down experience. It's still, I mean, it takes a long time and it's a lot of effort, but it's very different to the novel aspect. Um, and I, I love the process. The story is one of those ones that you think it's going one way and then it will get to a point and then you'll realize, Oh my God, it's completely different to what I thought it was completely different. And, mm-hmm. uh, I'm probably not giving too much away to say there's not, it's, it's not a happy ending kind of. Yeah. Fun, I like, uh, that's you know. great. Well, I mean, the title is let's sacrifice Laura Jean. So I'm guessing it's not, you know, it's not like let's buy Laura Jean a puppy. It's <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. 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 It's, it's a lot of grind, got a lot of grindhouse elements, but it's also, there's a mythology behind it and there's uh you know, there's other levels of stuff, but it, it it's, <laughs> And then, you know, hopefully there'll be some fun in there and all the rest of it as well. Um, yeah, a great experience though. And I can't wait. So I'm not sure exactly when it's going to start filming or anything, but it, um, knowing Justin, it'll probably be fairly soon. I'd say it'll get, get started. And I'm going, I'm actually now turning it into a novel, which will oh. probably be released before the, um, uh, before the film comes out. So people can read about it and then see how different the film is and how much I've messed up in the novel. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, then you have to add all that other stuff that all that annoying uh, additional detail to get the person into the car and out of the, you know, into the car. Yeah. That's what I I'm struggling on... with at the moment. Yeah. I'm oh, going really? through no kidding. Thinking, this, this was so much easier as a screenplay. Now it's like, I've got to think about, you know, motivations and things and like, why are they, uh, what color jeans is he wearing today? <laughs> well, but, but, you, but to your point from before, like it kind of makes sense. The thing that you have done most as I could see it is, writing comic books or graphic novels. So all mm. of those things, you have pictures to go along with it. I don't need to, to guess what she's wearing or he's wearing. Yeah. I don't need yeah. to think about him getting into the car because I see him in, in the car. He's there. That's right. right? You know? That's right. So so that's probably like, again, when you think about like the things that really kind of resonate with you, not that you can't do, do novels as well, but that probably is a little bit more like more comfortable, you know, because you don't have to think about all that stuff that you don't like to do. You don't like to eat your vegetables, so don't eat them. <laughs> exactly right and you, you know you get to a certain age where you just think eh, not gonna i'm not gonna bother with that um and the, yeah. the, the thing is you anyone that reads my novels will see that the most common complaint i get from novels are oh it was great it's just too short i just i need more which is good because i can then sell the next book right um but they're they're very fast they're uh, like not overly fast they're the normal size of a novel i'm not you know they're not like 20 pages or something but a lot happens it's it's quick there's a lot of twists that sort of stuff it's it's i probably write more like i'm writing for a movie or or a tv series than a novel i'm I'm still not convinced (laughs) i understand how to write a traditional novel because i don't think that's what these are um, but they're the sort of thing that I would like to read. And, they, and, they, and as the first reader, I, I read them and I think, yeah, that, that everything's there. It's a great story. It's twists and turns and all this sort of stuff. It hints at these bigger, broader fantasy sort of things, but without having to go through an in-depth detail. On every single thing. How, how many eyes did the monster have and what color were the eyes? And, that, you know, it's, it's just there's a monster and it's big and it's whipping around with things and it's, you know. Yeah, it's about to They're not all monsters, you. but, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's <laughs> going to eat you, so what's going to happen? Exactly. Yeah. I like it. And, and it's interesting, too, because I think that, like, as a consumer of this kind of content and all the stuff that we're talking about, I think I like both. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I can get down to your point. Like, so Stephen King, extremely detailed. I read 
the Dark Tower series, I've read all of them like seven, eight times. All of them. I've read them wow. multiple times. I fucking love it. The problem with it is that no one can ever adapt it into anything, into a TV series. Like no one, they try, yeah. but they fail. And I don't that would ruin it. Yeah. I, but I almost think it's like maybe they don't maybe they don't have enough of a, a love affair with the source material or really understand it enough to be able to do it. Because I think it's it's a really mm. interesting story, like Roland, fall, you know, showing up on the beach and getting his fingers getting a oh, spoiler alert to those who haven't been read this book in like 30 years. Get on the ball, <laughs> gets his fingers chopped off by like this lobster monstrosity thing. And then, you know, like all yeah. the, the the gathering of 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 his his travel companions like all this different thing, like, you know, those, those are the things that, that I think that are, would be interesting. People would like to see something like that. I just, I don't know what it is about that series that people get hung up about. It's a pretty, I want to say a straightforward story because it goes all over the place, but it's not that hard to, to you can do it. do it. You can you do can, it. You can definitely do it. And like, I mean, George R. R. Martin's the same thing. That thing is incredibly ridiculously complex when you read the novels, but they, right. they managed to do that to a certain point. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you as well, as a fan of that series. Yeah. No, and big spoiler for anyone that hasn't yeah, read them. I mean, but this is it's been long. Like this this series been, has been over for yeah. like 30 years, guys. <laughs> yeah. So knowing the end of the book, yeah. Is there gonna be a time where he has no fingers on one hand? Uh-huh. Or would he have lost that same finger every time? So he never loses it more than once because the lobstrosity was gonna get. Well, at the very, very end of the story, right? So he's, and this again, I'm so sorry. If you haven't read this, just to fast forward for like 15 seconds, he gets to the top <laughs> of the tower and he ends up right back at the beginning. Like it, yes. it takes him right back to the, to where he started. He was chasing a man in the desert in black, man in black in, in the desert. It's like, oh, you got to be kidding me, man. He got all the way there. But I believe, no. if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I read that last one. That he, um, in the in the next, the, the one that you're reading, that that next, um, I guess, cycle of the same things happening over and over to him again. He had Cuthbert's horn with him, like it was. He had something else with him that he didn't have before. So I think that the possibility yeah. is that all these permutations of the same timeline happening over and over again until. I don't know what necessarily there's something has to change in order to be able to unstick it. Otherwise, you know, this is like, you know, groundhog's day. Like hell. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you know what I mean? Well, what that, and that's what I like about it. It is. Yeah. Um, there is something different that he's different. He's physically different when he goes back yeah. into what he was the first time. And, yeah. and he has something that there's, so there's enough difference that it opens up possibilities for, yeah. is there a resolution in the future or, which I, I kind of like, like, I love the way uh, King puts an apology right before the last bit of the, <laughs> yeah. the book to I basically like, say to hey, his listen, readers, you guys sorry, are man. Be real upset about this. Yeah, this that's what right. happens. You're going to hate this. But that was really cool. But I, I actually writer. loved it. I, I, I thought, thought I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was amazing, and I thought there's no other way you can end this that's going to be satisfactory yeah, what's than a do? kind of like he, think he, about he, it, you know. Kim, the, Kim, the Crimson King and him are going to have a, a a step it up dance contest, like you know, like you know, yeah. like what, what's going to happen, um, you know. But uh, I, I agree. I, I think that that and that's something that you has to bring you great joy. <clears throat> it is the writer's prerogative to tell you how it ends, regardless. Yeah, you like it, yeah. you don't. It's a happy ending. It's a sad ending. Like the things that annoy me, and, and I'm I'm not sure if you're the same way. I love it when the bad guy wins. You know, yeah. uh, one of my favorite endings to anything ever, and it was the first time was such a shock, and I didn't see it coming. Was the Usual Suspects when Kevin Spacey just starts all of a sudden walking normal after he's limping out of the 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 the, yeah. the, uh, the police department? You're just like, oh, and then you see yeah. Chaz Palminteri realize that everything that he was telling him was just things around the room. Oh, yeah, that was around. Spoiler yeah. alert again, I guess, if you haven't watched The Usual Suspects, but I think it was like 1995 <laughs> it came out. So. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, it's it's much more satisfying to do something like that, and it's and it's much more satisfying when the villain is not just a, an apologist, a Star Wars villain, not just a, a kind yeah, of like right. evil villain, but yeah. is, is they have a reason, they have a, not that all Star Wars villains are like that, but anyway, we're, sorry, we're, 
we're having a debate internally in our house at the moment. I know. About Star oh, Wars. You, oh, is that? I was, I'm wondering why you're, you're saying you're like hedging here because like I, I don't think that we talked about Star Wars or the quality of villain. So I was like, why, are you yeah, having my, this fight with yourself about Darth I, Vader? I, or I'm, I'm self censoring, <laughs> but but in my opinion, the 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 reason why I favor Star Trek over I love both and I love them all, but I, I favor Star Trek over Star Wars because of the ambiguity in Star Trek. Um, yeah. from the beginning it's all philosophical questions and what's right what's wrong and and there's not often a clear right and wrong whereas in star wars it's very clear you're on the good side you're on the bad side and traditionally i think the villains are too villainous and the they're changing least, some of that now and mandalin uh, mandalorian and everything is, is completely changed that but yeah it's people that don't operate in the gray so you, what you yeah the, the kind of the um I think mistake in writing sometimes this is my opinion again i'm not by any stretch uh, an expert but the mistake in writing for me is like, if you don't have some level of likability or, or yeah. attractiveness to your antagonist, because like yeah. I'm going to get bored. I'm like, all right, this person's just like, you know, I'm it's just a, a, a ruthless monster that wants to kill you. Okay, great. It's not, yeah. And it's not that you've got to invest and, and it makes it that much more interesting when the villain is, someone yes. that you you invest in and that you think I not only can I see their point of view I think they're kind of right yeah but they can't do that because it's horrible you you can't do that thing right. but they're kind of right you know that's great because you could, the and and as a writer that's one of the things I love most is trying to guess how, what am I doing to the reader right here at this point yep. what am I making them feel what betrayal are they feeling and and so yeah, like, sometimes the editors will come back uh, and I love this uh with, with editors they'll come back with suggestions and all that sort of stuff but occasionally there'll be a note in the side that's just what you know with a question mark or <laughs> oh my god or, <clears throat> which is amazing because that shows you <clears throat> oh, great that thing that I was hoping would get a reaction got a reaction and that's 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 what I love most. It's getting, right. again, incredibly, incredibly rewarding. Um, the um, uh, and to your point, I think that the playing in the gray a bit and having some level of relatability to these characters, even if they're bad, you know, yeah. or sometimes when they're playing in the gray and, you know, there it's it's a it's a story of redemption where they were bad and they start to like kind of turn a bit. You know, maybe get pulled back a little bit, turn a bit, maybe turn all the way. You know, yeah. that, that's also interesting too, to a degree, as long as it's done right. Like, you know, um, Star Wars, I'll give credit to in this respect is that when at the end, when, like, because the, the Obi Wan Kenobi constantly said that there's still something, and I'm reading, I'm not sure if you're watching the series, the new series, Obi Wan, but I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. very good. It's very good so far. Yeah. Um, but the thing that you could see is, is really like taxing on him is that this was his Padawan. He still thinks there's something in there. That's good. He knows something in there is still good. And that's, he doesn't want to give up on him. You know, yeah. it was his responsibility. He messed up, or at least he thinks he messed up really, you know, em Emperor Palpatine came in and, and put the, put the hoodoo on, on Anakin and said, come on, yeah. man, being that's bad is good. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, you're right. Being good's for the pits. I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He but, yeah. He, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think and yeah, that it's um and again, I love Star Wars. I think it's fantastic. I loved it ever since I was a kid mm -hmm. with the originals. Um yeah, yeah, but it, it's <laughs> it, uh, the the force and the good versus bad yeah. and the traditional different colored lightsabers and all that sort of stuff. It for yeah, me kinda, it was too much of a too, of a, di a binary. clear dichotomy. It's like this is bad, yeah. this is good. Yeah, you don't need to uh, yeah. let me make my own decisions around that. Um Yeah. Uh, and and Star Trek to your point like they're they're uh well we are really nerding it up people are like geez uh that's right that's the whole point shut up turn off the, the you already got spoilers on things you didn't watch and read yeah so, go, go and find those other things yeah yeah get the bricks um so the uh star trek has got the the prime directive right it's yeah. like the the most important thing and it's like you have to this is these are our rules this is how you have to and never does any captain ever follow any of those rules ever? They just, I mean, <laughs> they they're, break they're them all like, the time. Yeah. you have to figure if you were like an, an, an admiral in, in, in Starfleet, you'd be like, what does, why even have a rule book? Come on. You guys are just, <laughs> I'm going to send another memo. Uh, 
and, and, and another memo just to remind everyone it's not a suggestion. It's one of our guiding principles. Yeah. But that's the thing I love. All of the captains all say this is a guiding principle and it's what we hold dear and everything. Yes. But we have to break it now because of whatever. But that, that's what makes it interesting, though, because if they didn't break it, it'd be a hell of a boring series. Nothing oh, it would, would happen. It, it would be a boring series. But they. But the, the funny thing is, like, there's never, like, the punishments doled out for breaking this prime directive. The most important thing in the world is, like, ah, we're going to bump yeah, you down like from uh, to, to Admiral to Captain. That's what we'll do to you, Mr. To, to Captain Kirk. Sorry. You know, like, you, yeah. you completely violated what we believe in, but... We're just going to demote we'll you. Put a you're note gonna... in your file. You get a yeah. you get a naughty note that says, "Yeah, he did a bad thing," and that's yeah, your it. performance yeah. evaluation is going to be uh, a fair, not a great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it, they is, get. it is. It is funny. I guess the future of punishment is pretty pretty weak. Although Khan knew how to punish people. Remember, you started putting the the the, the earwig into your. Oh man. <sighs> yeah, that was that was gross. Don't stick anything in my ears, man. No, uh, that's yeah. Or ears? No, no, no. That's that just no. yeah, yeah. That's that scares okay. me. You want to say, you want to scare somebody? And by the way, I 100 percent agree with uh, whoever told you that you were a horror writer. Uh, just all the stuff that you just talked about, <laughs> demons and and Lucifer and, and you know <laughs> monsters with multiple arms coming out of a wall. That's terrifying. But I, this is the other thing, though. What, what I was saying before about the Aphantasia, um, mm-hmm. I realized as well because uh, someone did a review on on the Seven Hungers. And I was still convinced this is a fantasy, like maybe a dark fantasy book, but that's about it. It's not horror, really. Right. And then they came, the, the review came through and I was saying, oh, you know, really great. There's some investigation elements and it's blah, blah, blah. Really graphic stuff happens. And I thought, really, though, is it? And I, now I realize it's because I'm not imagining any of it visually. Right. So You're not seeing like, me, oh, it's easy. Ah, oh, yeah. It's, it's she, she had her skin flayed off with a with a paring knife. Ah, it's not gross. What are you talking about? <laughs> but it's fine. It's like yeah, because I I, I can't visualize any of it. Uh, yeah. Whereas if it was a movie and I could see it, I would be probably horrified. Yeah, there is a lot of yeah, there are a lot of casualties and cre- uh, yeah, humans that are kind of broken apart and then reformed into a monstrous creature and stuff. Which that's even saying it, I can't imagine it. So it's like well, yeah, you it's, can't. It's, it's fun but, stuff, you know. What? Just let everybody else tell you for sure. Horror writer, yeah. <clears throat> which is great. Now your music, I wanted to ask you about this too. <clears throat> your music, um, I, I listened to a little bit of it on your website. It seems very, and again, based on what you said, you do it for TV and 200 TV shows, which is awesome. Very atmospheric, right? Yeah. Like it's it's like the backing track to what's happening. You know, is yeah. that is that mostly the kind of music that you produce? <laughs> These days, mostly, yeah, um, and particularly for film and TV, they don't want something that's too far in front because they want it to be behind the uh, the action because um, mm-hmm. the actors obviously <laughs> have to be at the forefront. Um, so, but but also, I'm not a singer um, uh, for very good reason, mainly because of my voice. Um, yeah, your voice, but uh, the voice, <laughs> yeah. So so I've I've always. Uh, yeah, and and I I go for melodic and emotional and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, honestly, that when you're writing for film and TV, you end up doing everything. So you you I might have certain preferences, mm-hmm. but you end up doing every style of music imaginable. Some of which you don't like that much, but you end up doing it anyway. I.e., country music, uh, and some of it that you you know lean more towards that you you do a lot more of. Um, I also for a while was doing hip hop music and uh, hip hop beats and mm-hmm. working with artists and all that sort of stuff. Man, that's a hard, hard graft uh, for for several reasons. But the one of the key reasons is um, artists don't pay for anything. The people that pay are producers, engineers, yep. you know, those sort of ones. So they're, they're willing to fork out money. So if you're trying to make money off artists, unless you find someone very big or that's on their way up or whatever, it's yeah. just incredibly hard to make money out of it. So uh, that one's on hold for a little bit, the hip-hop. Plus, I'm not convinced I understand hip-hop as well, which makes it difficult to write. This, write this well, song. yeah, I understanding. I mean, now for a guy that doesn't have any visual imagination, you're able to get over that, that, uh, uh, yeah. you know, that challenge. But my band was a fusion hip hop band. So we, nice. it was a, a lot of different styles of music. We were, again, I think this has to do with the fact of that the people that I was playing with. And and when I would write songs, like just my brain, not being able to stick 
in one genre. I wanted everything to kind of be rooted in this idea. And I think that we all did. It wasn't just me, but we all had this idea. It's like the foundation of this is going to be hip hop. We're going to have people, we have two vocalists, one of which is my absentee co-host. And, um, you know, but we played, we, we played like one song we have, like it goes from like, uh, like hard, like rock music, like but hot, you know, as the background, you know, again, yeah. with the hip hop and then it gets spacey and then it gets into surf music. It's like, it goes everywhere, but it all fits. Yeah. You know, so, you know, we had, um, we had a good run and, you know, got an opportunity to uh, sign with an indie label, which we blew because, you know, we're in a band and that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's part of the reason why I just do it all solo because Smart. yeah, I don't have to deal with anyone else. Yeah. 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 yeah you have to try to find a bass player or a drummer. Oh, they're never, they're never easy to find. Although our drummer kicked ass, uh, Anthony Matthews, one of the best drummers that I've ever seen. Uh, ridiculous. Uh, but um, mm. no, so, so um, what's, what, what's got you excited now? What's coming up for you? that you're excited about? What's the next thing that you're like, I cannot wait for this to get off the ground. I can't wait for people to see it, hear it, whatever. Oh, so yeah. So the Amnity comic that we spoke about, um, I've got a Kickstarter running for that. Uh, hopefully in August that'll launch. Um, so that'll be, I think at this stage, it's looking like two, two comic issues uh, in full color, a graphic novel in black and white, uh, another comic in black and white and a small color comic and a novel. Um, Cause I've got a novel version of that, that whole story as well. Uh, oh, and a, and a soundtrack of course, because music, why, why wouldn't you? Of course. Um, so it's, it's a big, it's a nice big uh, package. <laughs> I can yes. say that. That's Lots probably the wrong. I have a large package. Morgan has a, nice, a very large package. He's proud of it. Uh, you can't see it. But uh, not yet. Not <laughs> yet. But in soon. August, <laughs> I'll be unveiling the package, and I would like everyone to come and look at the package, uh, and even purchase the package if that's yeah. uh, of interest yes. to them. Yeah. Well, if it's for sale, someone's going to buy it. <laughs> yeah. no, wait, you, you mentioned too, like that, uh, that you, um, and this was something also I found interesting. You, you do like all your own uh, crowdfunded, um, basically, mm-hmm. you know, get, get your 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 own. Um, uh, uh, getting your own investments from the people of the world by Kickstarters. Um, so talk about that a little bit. Like that's what, what got you, you mentioned that you're a good business person. So I'm guessing that this is kind of coming from some of that background of, I think I could raise money in this way. And I saw some of the trailers and they get you. They're like, yeah, I want mm. that. that's fantastic. Totally want to see yeah. that. Totally want to read that. Yeah, it, well, it's uh, it's one it's fairly big in in indie comics to to raise money to to because for those that don't know, um, a, a one page of artwork might run you anywhere from, you know, a hundred dollars to five hundred dollars depending on who you're going through. So if you're getting a twenty two to twenty five page uh, or twenty four page comic, that's a lot of money. You know, you're talking two, three, four, five thousand dollars per issue. Yep, and that's up front, and then you have to recoup that money. So crowdfunding is a good way to do that. Um, and it's also a good way for someone like me that's in Australia to get fans overseas to start mm-hmm. to know my work and reach out. It's it's basically like a a, a, a worldwide comic con um, where you can set your stall up and sell things to people all over the world and all that sort of stuff. And there's, there's an entertainment value to it as well. So the last campaign I ran, uh, I gave away theme songs. So uh, uh, two or three theme songs, individual theme song for you, whatever you want, you can use it for whatever you want. Mm-hmm. It just as a bit of fun, you know? Um, so it's, it's good fun as well. It's a good way to get it out there. Um, uh, so my, some of my comics and novels are with public, like traditional publishers. Um, some of them are just with me or, or some of them I'll start with myself before I go to another. So I try and recoup costs before I go to a publisher. Right. Um, and yeah, I found it great. It's an interesting experience and there are definitely ups and downs. So you'd, you'd want to talk to someone before you start, you uh, like which yeah. again, I didn't do. Um, but uh, I'm experienced Learn from enough Morgan's now mistakes. to know. Where, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, but yeah, it's great. It's great for that. And it, it's also, it means you can just, you've got something you can, an event you can promote and push out there and get interest in. And people kind of get wrapped up in the, you know, the magic of the whole thing. And uh, I do this time around, I'm considering producing uh, an indie, like a terrible indie film, like a, a two minute indie film that I'll put together that certain backers can uh, pick that perk and then they can appear in it. So they just record themselves, oh, no. you know, and I'll, I will <laughs> add them to the video, a post-apocalyptic kind of 
<laughs> just for something goofy to do, you know, that's, add a bit of fun great. to the whole thing. It's, it's creative. Again, it's, it's a really yeah. interesting way to get people hooked in to do something, uh, something different. And uh, trust me, <clears throat> as somebody who uh, I, promotion is a very important part of the businesses that we're in, like in writing, yeah. in, in music, whatever it is, in podcasting, you know, we we're fortunate that we have gained a pretty large audience, which is awesome. Um, but it took effort. It was not, yeah. and it's still an yeah. ongoing thing. I'm not, we're not, we're not Rogan over here. Um, I'd love to <laughs> have Rogan money at some point. <clears throat> yeah. Wouldn't we Just all? not yet. But uh, it, it is, um, it is important to be able to do that element of the business. I think a lot of people miss that piece. It's, it's quality, yeah, yeah. right. Creating quality work. And then also uh, being able to, um, to be able to promote yourself properly and know the right things that work uh, and be creative with it. Like you might, you can probably barely see it, but behind me, there's a tournament bracket. Um, and every year that, and this is our third annual uh, we've, we've done something called Stinko de Mayo. It always starts in May. It never ends in May because it just, it can't. Um, but it's, <laughs> we take a period of time where we take the worst music, the worst TV shows, the worst fads or novelties and the worst uh, movies of that particular era and they combat each other in a March oh, mile nice. style tournament. Yeah. So right now we're oh, down to the, cool. we are down to the final four. Um, we have Millie Vanilli, the champion of the music bracket <laughs> going up against a show uh, called she's the sheriff, which starred Chrissy from three's company as a sheriff who inherited wow inherited being the sheriff from her dead husband, which I don't think is how that works. That's, that's how that works. That, that tracks. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I was wrong. Um, yeah. and then on the other side, we've got hammer pants, which is our fad winner, not surprisingly versus, nice. uh, the movie Leonard part six starring Bill Cosby. And, uh, it is <laughs> quite possibly the worst movie that's ever existed. <laughs> Wow. But we have our fans participate. They all fill out brackets and there's a cash prize and stuff like that. So you got to do some things that are a little bit outside the box to get people interested. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you can't, as a writer or musician or whatever, <clears throat> the days are gone where you can just sort of squirrel away in secret and then hand it over to a publisher and they will do all that for you. They won't do any of that for you. You've got to get your face out there. You've got to promote, which yeah. most of us hate, but you, you have yeah. to do, you got to find a way to do it and just get it done. Wait a minute. You don't like this? I thought we were having fun. I'm sorry, man. Except for the odd podcast, which I love, mm -hmm. everything else I hate. Uh, well, actually, it's, it's that thing. The more you do, the more you, um, yeah. you know, people will look at my stuff and I'm not shy. You'll see, you'll see my face everywhere because that's what you've got to do. And I figured just embrace it. Just for a long you time, I didn't. Do. And you've yeah. got to do it. So you might as well just do it. Yeah. Well, you're exposing yourself to a different again, you're similar to what you did with your Kickstarter. You're exposing yourself to these different audiences that you would not have had access to had you yeah. not done that. Um, and you, it, those kinds of things, those grassroots efforts really do make a difference. Like eventually, yeah. those it's a force multiplier, and you get you get a lot of fans. And you're like, wow, I can't believe I started again. You oh, we had uh, uh, wow, we hit ten YouTube subscribers, yay! Like now you're twenty five hundred YouTube subscribers. It's like wow, what yeah. happened? All of a sudden people yeah. actually listen to us. So like, those are the kinds of things that I, again, you have to do as a, as an artist. So I, I respect, I respect the hustle, Morgan. I do. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Ditto. Ditto. Um, so, okay. We're going to, we're going to wrap up here, but what I would say to all of our fans, um, first of all, go check out um, Morgan's website. That's, that's where you can get a lot um, of, of his, his stuff and his, it's um, morganquaid.com, uh, Q-U-A-I-D. Now, I didn't ask if he was related to Randy or to Dennis. Yeah, I didn't think you were. Uh, <laughs> that's why my first question my, uh, my co-host asked, because we, um, we're also famous. One of the things that's really sweet about this podcast is we always get like the brother of somebody or the uncle of somebody that's incredibly yeah, yeah, famous. Yeah. And, and great, by the way, they're cousin, lovely people. Yeah. yeah. So we, you yeah. know, like, you know, Colin Jost, you know yeah. who that is, the guy from Saturday Live. We had his brother yeah. Casey on. He's part of the Impractical Jokers crew. And he's fantastic, hilarious, uh, like super talented, not, taking cool. nothing away from him. But we never get the Colin. We always get the Casey. <laughs> yeah. 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 You need a couple more zeros on the subscribers and then they'll be, they'll yeah, be, they'll be rolling up. in. That's right. Yeah. It's all, it's all about yeah. that. So go to, so morganquaid.com look out for um, his upcoming I, 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 package. 
<laughs> and then he, which is going to be uh, like in, in 15 different versions, color, black and white. It's going to be yeah. a graphic novel. It's going to be in comic book form. It's going to be in, in novel form. So you're going to be able to see, I'm sure at some point these things are going to get optioned for movies that will terrify you uh, since he is in fact a horror writer. Um, <laughs> and obviously the screenplay, which uh, I'm guessing if principal shooting will occur eventually very soon. Uh, uh, it will at some point. Yes. At some point. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> so um, everyone go check out his, his, his work. It's fantastic. Check out his music um, and stay tuned for all things. Morgan Quaid, Morgan. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>